everybody. Uh, thank you for being present on site remotely. So today we are here for um, a presentation uh, on the closed uh, loop automation on um, the claim of the IDH uh, European project. We have uh, uh, a total of uh, four speakers, uh, five speakers. In fact, uh, we have first uh, Nuri Elas, who is a PhD student in Kimono, who will start the presentation. Then uh, uh, Naresh Modina, who is a postdoc in CNAM as well, who will continue. And Passion, who is also, Passion Tumba, who is also a postdoc uh, researcher uh, in CNAM, who will then uh, follow up. And then we have a demo session in which Salah Biruba and uh, Yung Chifu will, uh, uh, will display um, a, present, uh, a demonstration of uh, part of the architecture that will be presented by. Uh, all the persons, so thank you very much for participating. And uh, you can, if you want, make questions during the presentation. In this case, we ask you to raise your hands either in the room or remotely. Thank you very much. I can start. So, uh, hello everyone. I am Nuri Elas and I am a PhD candidate here in CNAM. And today I'm going to present um, a joint work with my colleagues and my supervisor on closed loop automation. So, um, I will start by introducing the background and the architecture of the closed loop in general. And then I will present some blocks of the closed loop, such as the anomaly detection framework and the IF placement optimization. Then I will leave the, I will leave the floor for my colleagues to complete the presentation. So um, actually this work is focusing on closed loop network automation. And the main goal is to achieve zero touch networks for 5G and beyond 5G systems. So as you know, the classical way to do that is to leverage data analytics to mimic the um, the observe and analyze act loop for realizing real time and self adaptive network automation. And one of the examples that are very well known in the literature are the MAPE uh, closed loop from IBM. The thing is that if you look at the 5G and beyond 5G services, is that we have such a heterogeneous quality of service requirement that maybe when we have human in the loop orchestration, this might not satisfy it. So what the goal now is to try to include the artificial intelligence within the map, for example, the map loop uh, bricks in order to make it automatic and intelligent. So for the what we call AI driven closed loop automation, it's to adapt the uh, is to adopt the AI ML techniques, for example, to analyze the data or to, mon to monitor the data or even to take some de decisions on the network orchestration. So if we focus on the closed loop, so the general idea is that we have a current state and then we will try to uh, to do some data monitoring in order to analyze this state and to try to be, for example, in normal working conditions to go to the desired state. For that, we should take sometimes some decisions. And for that, we are introducing the map loop, which is composed of set of component. One of them is the monitor. So the monitor will be uh, the, the component that will be collecting the data from the infrastructure that you want to uh, orchestrate, for example. And then this data will be sent to the analyzer. So the analyzer is for the data analytics, and it could be, for example, based on machine learning or AI techniques. And then once you have these results from the analyzer, it will be leveraged by the uh, the planner. So the planner could be, for example, um, to plan the decision that we should take, such as Vienna scaling or other uh, other decisions that are such as rerouting some packet, etc. And then once we have this decision on what we want to do, it will be sent to the orchestrator. So the orchestrator, for example, if we are using uh, NF NFV, it could be the VNF uh, infrastructure manager. So before going through our work, uh, we would like to go through uh, some works from the literature that has been written on uh, the map loop. For example, this work, it has the, the authors actually wanted to show their vision on the uh, zero touch network orchestration and the management for end to end network slices. And the thing is that they went through each block and they tried to explain how we could use them 
and how to develop them. For example, if we take the monitoring, they have proposed to do some intelligent monitoring in order to choose, for example, the best sampling rate to collect data. And then for the analyzer, they have proposed two components, one for the pre-processing and one for the data analytics. For the data analytics, if we are using some machine learning model, it means that for the results from the inference model, this, these ones should be um, used by the planner. And as they are working on the uh, management of end-to-end -end network slicing, so they have proposed in, within the planner to use a slice orchestrator. So for example, it could be the number of VNF that we should deploy within the chain. And then they have also developed the idea of the um, at the executor part. So uh, there is the NF orchestrator. There is also the network controller in case, for example, the NF orchestrator is not able to ensure this connectivity. And then we have also the uh, the radio intelligence controller since they are trying to do some end to end network slicing. So they also they were also focusing on the run part. So one thing from this work is that there were no implementation of the framework. And another work that's also we found in the literature is about the closed loop orchestration and management also for the slicing and also they were trying to detect some SLA violations. So they have used the uh, cloud pack for network automation, a solution from ABM in order to deploy the slices in a containerized manner. And then they were trying to they were trying to collect data to implement the whole closed loop also based on the MAPE, uh, the MAPE engine. So they used Prometheus, for example, to collect data, and then they used the uh, the NWDAF for data analytics. They were trying to use it. The, um, the, the notification that we, they will get from the NWDAP to do the orchestration part. So um, our review about this work is that the, the proposal first is not open source, and also they were using IBM Watson IOPS metric manager for centralized anomaly detection. So it means if they have a lot of data, uh, they are not sure to have um, to be able to detect, for example, anomalies in this case in a real time manner. Now we can go to our work. So this is the um, the architecture on which we are relying on. So this is the closed loop automation control system, which is composed of a set of bricks. You t if you take the connect compute fabric, actually it's, it's, uh, it refers to the infrastructure that we, from which we want to monitor the data and we want to apply our decision. So we have developed a data pipelining system that will collect the distributed data in real time and then send the data to, uh, to the other brick, brick, which is the, the analyzer. The analyzer is actually a federated learning based anomaly detection framework. And before doing the training, so the idea was also to use an optimization uh, algorithm in order to uh, decide on the number and placement of the uh, the node. Since we are on federated learning, that will be doing the training. Once we have the inference results, so it will be sent to the decision making uh, bricks, which is based also on reinforcement learning. And then the actions will be sent to the orchestrator to the orchestrator that will be applied on the uh, on the infrastructure. So just to recall a bit the um, the the uh, the representation or the platform that was proposed in the project of AI at Edge. So uh, just to note that it was split into uh, two layers. So we have the uh, NSAP layer where we are going to have our orchestrator to take this uh, to apply this decision. So we can consider, for example, the non real time rig, the multi tier orchestrator, or even the slice manager. And we also have this second layer, which which actually uh, represent the infrastructure on which we are, for example, uh, for example, deploying our uh, our nodes, and for, from which we are going to collect the data. So, the mon monitoring, analyzing, and um, and the planning will be on the connect compute part, and then the orchestration uh, will be taken. Uh, the decision of the orchestration will be taken and, and applied at the NSAP part. And also we have adapted the uh, representative architecture of the uh, of the IAF. So in addition to the fourth 
to the fourth uh, to the fourth uh, interfaces that were proposed by the project we have added another one so the first interface is for the orchestration for example it could receive from this interface the um, some parameters to orchestrate the IAF and then we have the second one is about the control plane uh, interface for example to exchange the parameters with other IAFs we have the third interface is for the data plane it could receive some data for example from other IAFs and also we have the IAF4 which is for hardware acceleration for example if you want to uh, connect this IAF with uh, a hardware accelerator and for IAF5, it is for the data pipelining system. If we are having uh, another system to generate data, so we could receive this data on the fifth interface. So uh, now I'm going to present the, um, the, uh, the framework for the anomaly detection that will be used by the analyzer break. So this framework is using um, LSTM cells. And it is based on some autoencoders. So an autoencoder is composed of one encoder and one decoder. The encoder will receive data and will try to compress this um, the, the high dimension input data into a latent space latent space with uh, with less dimensions. Then we have the decoder that will be trying to reconstruct from the latent space some um, some data and try to to try to to retrieve the same input. So uh, just to note that the, the autoencoder should be trained on uh, three anomaly data samples in order to uh, represent, for example, the, uh, the normal working conditions of a system. And in the latent spa space, so the anomalous samples, they can appear significantly different from the nominal ones. And in order to say if we have uh, to decide if we have uh, an anomaly or not, so we need to compute the reconstruction error. So the reconstruction error uh, could be, for example, the MSE, the mean squared error, if it is upper than uh, a given threshold. So we can say that this sample is contains an anomaly. So for the threshold, it is actually co computed from the uh, from the training set uh, based actually on the uh, nth percentile of the error distribution of the, this training data set. So the framework that we are going to use, we take it from the literature. It is called Syroka framework, and it is an anomaly detection framework for softwareized uh, environment. So as you can see here, actually this framework is able to, for, to get the data from different, different layers. I mean, you can detect anomalies at the physical layer, at the virtual layer, but also at the access layers, such as the genome bees. So, for each type of data, what, or maybe group of data, if I can say that, we are going to use one autoencoder. So we will have one, one specific autoencoder to train it on a specific type of data. This will actually allow us to detect anomalies on several uh, type of metrics and several levels of the data. And as I said before, the goal is finally to learn the normal con the normal working con the conditions of a system. So to do that, we need to train that for the first time the data on uh, on a relatively long and sufficient the data training because we need to learn data seasonalities. So uh, the LSTM autoencoders that has been used in this work, you can see them on the picture. So you have the encoder, the autoencoder, and there is also a dropout the regularization level to avoid the, um, the overfitting. So the, the, the framework that I have just pre presented is a centralized uh, framework. It means that you will have only one node that will be doing all the training. And since as I said at the beginning, that we are trying to do some uh, some network configuration in real time. It means also the training should be, should be done in real time. The idea was instead of using centralized training, we propose to use federated learning. So this architecture here, if you can see it, the framework is now called the FLAH XG or X generation, it means 5G or more. And then here you have two parts so you have the client 
will actually call the edge, and then you have the server. Because for an, for federated learning, you need to have some client that will be lo doing the local training, then we send their parameters to the uh, centralized server for aggregation. So we have the infrastructure from, which, from where we are going to collect the data, and then we will be sending in distributed way this data to the client IAF that will be doing the training locally. Before starting the, the this training part, so the client should register to the FL server. So the server can then send the initialization parameters and it should be the same model, same initialization parameters for all the clients of this framework. So the goal is that we need to minimize the global loss function using the Fed average function that was proposed by Federated Learning and that for each group of metric and each level of data. So now that I have presented the framework for the anomaly detection, we have here, so we said that we are going to have some edge client IAF that will be doing the training. So the goal is, that the, the point here is that where should we deploy this IAF for the training and also how many cli IAF clients should we deploy in order to do it in real time. So for that, we are proposing an algorithm in order to choose the optimal, uh, the optimal placement and the number of IAFs that I will present just after. So if we go back to our closed loop, we can start with this first brick here, which is the IAF placement algorithm. So this will be the, the starting point of our closed loop by deploying an algorithm in order to decide on the number and the placement of the IAFs. So I'm going back to the general architecture of federated learning. So we have here one FL server IAF and the set of uh, edge IAFs that will be receiving data from uh, external nodes, for example. And the goal here is, as I said, to, de to, uh, to decide on the number and the placement of these edge IAFs. So uh, we also propose the possibility of, for example, choosing some nodes with hardware acceleration in order to also decrease this, uh, this training time. So um, in our work, we also consider the training time, the communication time and some stochastic delays. And the, also we consider that the nodes are heterogeneous uh, in terms of CPU capacity. The, the final goal is actually to reduce the number of stragglers, which is, uh, which is a known problem in federated learning. I mean, for example, imagine that you are choosing uh, maybe two edge IAFs, one with very high CPU and another one with very low CPU. So you, will, you may receive maybe the first parameters as the, as the server, and then maybe after a long time, you will receive the, the others. So, this is what we call the straggling effect of federated learning, and the goal of this algorithm is to reduce this effect. So just to also give another example of a random and a planned placement, imagine that you have a set of nodes and that you want to place some IAFs. Here, for example, we have done, uh, we have done um, a random placement of these IAFs. The thing is that if you want to do some and some anomaly, some maybe retraining of the uh, of the network in real time. It means that we have a target learning time that we should not uh, exceed. In that case, we can consider it as tau plus delta. So here, with the random placement, we have chosen three nodes to to place our IAFs. We can see that the second node <coughs> couldn't respect this target time because maybe it doesn't have enough capacities or enough resources in order to respect this target time. But here, for example, if we are doing a planned placement, it means that we are going to estimate the, um, the resources that, that, that we have on the nodes. And we can also estimate the end-to-end -end learning time of each IAF. And we can do or plan uh, an optimal placement in order to respect this target time as we have done here. So we knew that if we are going to choose this node, it will take more time than it won't respect the target time. So what we have done is that the, the algorithm have chosen another, um, another node with some hardware acceleration in order to reduce the training time. Then 
to reduce the overall end-to-end -end training time. So the problem was actually is can be considered as a, a graph embedding problem. So we have uh, as a constraint to respect the end-to-end -end target time. And also if we have, we consider that we are having some hardware acceleration on some nodes, but still we need to do it in intelligent manner because choosing all the nodes with hardware acceleration might not be uh, the uh, the best the best solution for the placement. We also can consider for uh, this setting two possible uh, placement of the FL server. So the FL clients are always placed as the edge network. But for the server, we have considered two possibilities. The first one is where the FL server is deployed at the cloud, and the second one is where the um, FL server is deployed as the edge. So uh, we have also considered that we might have two different situations. We have, we, uh, as I said before, we are doing some estimation of the training time. So this estimation is considered as a, a nominal tra training time. I mean, we can say that the training time is related to the, 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 the data size that we are having and also uh, about the CPU maybe the CPU resources that we are having. So it, it is dependent on these two parameters. But sometimes, even if for two nodes, even if we are having the same CPU resources, the same size of data, but we are not sure to have the same training time because sometimes the CPU is busy in doing some other things. For that, we have considered that we might have some stoch stochastic delays on, on some node and we have generated that randomly. So we have considered that we may have three different situations, for example, that when the um, one, for example, the, uh, the we, we accept a very low delays and we may call it, for example, very like, strict time constraint. And then we may have we may also accept some medium or loose time constraint in that case. So this stochastic delay can be higher. So. As I said, we are considering a time decomposition and we're not only considering the local training time, but also the communication delay. So for that, we have proposed uh, <coughs> a time decomposition modeling. So we are considering the local training time, which is directly related to the, uh, to the CPU resources and to the data size. And also we are considering the propagation delay, which are can be unpacked can, can are, that are related to the uh, to the type of uh, of links that we are using, and we also have proposed two uh, two time uh, two, uh, two 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 component drift. One to represent the uh, stochastic delay that might occur at the training phase, and also we are considering some stochastic delays that might occur uh, at the uh, propagation delays. We are also considering a target time that we should not exceed when we are uh, doing the training. And we are also we have also added some maximum tolerated delay. I mean, if you took the tr target time, this should be the time the time after which the uh, the edge IAF should send their models to the um, to the IAF server. But we also consider that maybe the server can have some more time, some extra delays before starting this aggregation, uh, this ag aggregation step. So this can be tolerated if we, for example, between these two time we can receive the parameters. So in our case, as I said, the goal is to reduce the number of stragglers. So a stragglers is when the IAF is having its end-to-end -end time. I mean, training, communication delays, and also the stochastic delays can be between tau and tau plus delta. So it should also be in this, um, I mean, in this uh, interval. So if we are more than tau plus delta, this IAF shouldn't even be deployed. But if it is more than delta and less than delta, then more than tau and, and less than tau plus delta, so it should be accepted, but this is considered as a straggler and the goal is to reduce this number of stragglers while respecting of course the target time so uh, the, for for evaluating and estimating these times what we have done is that we got the framework of federated learning that i have just 
presented later, uh, this um, a few minutes ago, and then we try to understand how this training time behaves when we increase the number of IAFs and also when we when we increase the CPU resources. So we have tried, we have we have done an estimation of two IAFs, four IAFs, and six IAFs while running the uh, FLAD XJ for the anomaly detection using different types of data. So here, you, if you can see, the training time is reducing when we increase the number of IAFs and also when we increase the number of CPU cores. So based on that, we were trying to, um, to evaluate our model to see if, we, um, if the uh, target time will be respected when using real, real data from, uh, from, the, from the anomaly detection framework. To do so, so we have run this, this framework several times, but the problem is that we didn't have enough uh, enough resources, so we could test it only on a total number of CPU, which is equal to 50 CPU cores. So what we have done is that we got the um, the original data set and we tried to do some um, some some uh, data generation to get a synthetic data set that should follow the same uh, correlation coefficient. So for that, we could go from 50 CPU cores until 250 CPU cores in order to be able to test our model on um, real estimated training times and also on a higher number of nodes. So uh, we have also proposed some uh, some parameter settings, for example, for the um, for the propagation delays. So we consider different propagation delays for uh, the, for edge edge and core edge sitting. For example, if we take the first one, the, the server, the FS server would be placed at the um, at the edge. It means that the propagation delay should be low a bit when compared to the core edge sitting. For that, so the maximum one way latency was equal to uh, the 25 uh, quantile value of the training time during one epoch divided by 10. And therefore, the next setting we wanted to increase the propagation delay, so we take that the maximum one-way latency was equal at the, the mean value of the training time during ten epochs. So, other uh, parameter settings is about the uh, different case that we have been testing. So, we test we wanted to evaluate the impact on the, of the stochastic and deterministic values on the, the on the placement model. So we have tested uh, both deterministic uh, values for training time and propagation delay, and then we switch it. We, we have also used deterministic training time with stochastic propagation delay, and also we have used when we have tested also when both of them are stochastic. For the topology that we have used, the Stamandala topology with 16 edge nodes, so a total of 26, uh, 26 nodes. And we have compared four resolution approaches. So we have used our, our model when no hardware is available. We also have used our model that we call IFLC when 50% of the nodes are equipped with hardware acceleration. And then we also have used the same, our model we, when all the nodes are equipped with hardware acceleration. We compare all these to a first fit, uh, a first fit algorithm that will try to increase the number of IAFs and will stop once the end-to-end -end training time is not decreasing anymore. So um, other parameter settings are about the, um, the acceleration factors. So we say that we may uh, we may activate some hardware accelerator on the uh, on the node, so we will try to understand how it will impact this, uh, how this acceleration factor is. So we took these values from uh, from uh, a paper that we found in the literature. We found that acceleration factor decreases by 370 percent when we increase the number of CPU cores from one to 16. So we have proposed that we are having randomly between 1 and 16 CPU cores, and then try to do some piecewise linear fitting in order to get the values between them. And we also have tested different levels of strictness. For example, for the target time, we put two seconds and then four seconds. We try to increase the number of epochs from, from 60 to 105, and then we also put the maximum tolerated delay as 
four times less than the target time. And therefore the stochastic delays. So we have tested different scenarios. So uh, the highest, uh, the highest stochastic delays may reach nearly twice the nominal time. So uh, just to analyze some results before applying the results into the um, into the framework. So we try to see uh, the, this number of struggling IAFs when we compare the four approaches that I have that I have presented. So we can see that the worst case scenario refers to the first fit algorithm. Actually, even if it is trying to increase the number of IAFs to decrease the end-to-end -end training time, if we don't really uh, select or imply this time decomposition, we are not sure that we are going to respect once the target time and also to, um, to avoid the IAF struggling. And also you can see that, uh, for example, here, you have the AFLSE and AFLSE with 8 and 16. They may have like very close uh, solutions. So uh, the thing is that for the moment we have seen that since we only have 16 nodes, we have seen that having 50% of nodes with equipped hardware acceleration was uh, was finally enough to um, to have the optimal solution. Then we have for the, vari the variance in the training time. The, the thing also to note here is that in order to reduce the number of stragglers, we will also try to reduce this variance because the, the stragglers finally, they, they come from this variance in the training time. So you can also see that the first fit is not really caring about this variance in the training time. So it will just try to activate the highest number of IAF in order to reduce the um, the end-to-end -end learning time. But in that case, we may have some nodes where, for example, one is very has very high CPU resources, the other one has very low CPU resources, which can cause this uh, this very high variance. And we have for the number of IAF, so you can see that for the same uh, the same conditions. The first fit is increasing the number of IAFs compared to our solution. So when we have no hardware acceleration, we can reach four IAFs that are activated and two one hardware acceleration as are are available. However, for uh, for the case of first fit, so we could attend six uh, six active IAFs, and this actually will impact the, um, the 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 CPU cost because the more you have the IAF the highest is the cost, the final cost, I mean, in terms of CPU resources. And our goal was actually to reduce the number of IAFs because we need to reduce the final uh, the, uh, the the final cost, which is related to the CPU cost. Of course, if you are this, this is actually these results are are related to um, a specific batch size of data. So if we increase the data size, of course, the final number of IAF will increase. So once we have the uh, once we are decided on the number and the placement of the IAFs, now comes the um, the training of the uh, anomaly detection model. So we should specify the placement and the number of IAFs, then we go through the training. For the moment, we are doing that uh, we are doing that manually, but in the next step, it will be to do it to integrate it in automatic way. So. Before doing a proof of concept, the idea was to develop a an open 5G platform to emulate actually the data for uh, the network orchestration. So for that, we have emulated traffic from a real world French operator of a tech region from uh, in, in France. And then we have emulated 16 days of traffic demands based on application level net flow like Flux. And it is related to um, an air project, a French project, which is called Coco 5G. So uh, when replaying the data, so no mobility, no memo was replayed for the moment. So the data it is related to attack region. It is composed of 52 UEs, 13 GNODPs with four towers, and then uh, 20 access point. And this is the emulated platform. So we have here three sites, three physical servers that will be emulating the, um, the, the, the GNODPs. So the first one will have the two first towers 
and it is composed of six Gnode bees. And then we have another physical server that will be uh, implementing uh, four Gnode bees, and the final one will be implemented three other Gnode bees. And also we have Kubernetes system to deploy the core uh, the core system, so it is composed of three uh, three physical servers. And then we have the Gnode bees and UEs that are you, that were deployed using SRS run EPC, uh, so the core function because we are here in non standalone uh, in five G non standalone. So EPC comes from Open 5G system. And then for uh, replaying the data, so we were using uh, NS3 in order to generate the UE traffic to, and then it was a client server architecture. So the traffic was generated at the UE and it passes through the, the EPC to arrive to, to, the, to the server. So uh, from that platform, we could collect uh, 15 days of data. So uh, 16 days, sorry, of data. So 15 days for, uh, 14 days for training and one day for test set. So for the physical layer to collect data, it was using a node exporter with Prometheus. And then for the virtual layer, it was with C advisor from Kubernetes. So uh, this is actually the number of uh, features that were collected for each layer and each type of metric. For example, for the physical layer, there were four type of metrics, CPU, memory, network, and uh, disk data. So um, we are like a, a bit less than 1000 features for CPU, 215 for memory, and 1400 for network and 641 for disk. For containers, also it, also it was a bit less. And then for GnodeB data, so we had 32 CPU-related uh, uh, features, two for memory and two for network. And for the sampling rate, so the minimum, we took the minimum, so it was 150 milliseconds for both physical and container data that are related to node exporter and CD advisor. And then we have 80 milliseconds for Gnode bees. And then, of course, when we have the data, we need to clean it. So uh, the data should uh, firstly be split into gauge and counters, and then to do some extra columns added by some nodes that we need to delete. And then the uh, the data was um, was transformed into to fit the zero one values in order to be able to have like a better detection with LSTM. So now we go through the anomaly detection. So the um, the idea was to go from to start from low grain anomalies to high grain definition using the MSC, the mean squared error uh, analysis, using based on set of resources, and then we can try to see what, which are the metrics that will deviate from the uh, normal uh, working conditions, and then. For the test set, so uh, some anomalies were injected in the last day of the uh, of the collection. We had like CPU stress, packet loss, bandwidth shaping, and link link failures. And we have presented some uh, some plots to compare the centralized and the federated learning frameworks. So now we have uh, we're based on three uh, anomalies that were injected, which are the stress CPU, the stress bandwidth, and the um, the, uh, the the link failure. So uh, the goal was to compare the Sayroka that we took from the state of the art and the FL uh, FLADXJ. The thing is that the Sayroka, of course, should have the same performance when we increase the number of IFs because it is centralized. We have only one IF. And for the uh, for the FLA edge, you can see that. Increasing the number of IFs doesn't really mean that we are increasing or decreasing the performance. So the only explanation that we are having now, and actually we are working on that, is that when we are, uh, as we are doing some federated, some uh, horizontal federated learning, it means that we are going to split the data that we are get getting like in batch of data. And maybe the reason why we are having this is that so when we are selecting this uh, this number of IAFs, maybe sometimes when the performance is high, it means that the data is having enough in and the model is or the IAF is having enough information about the data the data seasonality, and when it decreases, maybe we don't we are not having enough data 
I mean, not in terms of number of samples, but maybe the, the quality of data is not good to, um, to, to have a good model. And then for that, the uh, one of the conclusions that we in our IAF placement optimization, we may have include the, um, we should include the uh, some quality of learning as a as a constraint in the model in order to not only decide on the number of the uh, and the number of the of, and the placement of the IAF, but also maybe we should do some estimation of the um, of the quality of the learning. Well, thank you. I will pass the, the floor to my colleague. Thank you very much, Noor, for the heavy lifting. Uh, so my name is Naresh. Uh, I'm a postdoc at uh, CNAM. Uh, I'm working with Stefano and Pedro. Uh, now I'll present uh, uh, the block uh, which is so important for this, uh, for uh, enabling the automa uh, automatic closed loop um, for this uh, test bed. Um, it's called automated reconfiguration. Uh, Noor has clearly established uh, the fundamental blocks uh, that are needed for this closed loop automation uh, control system, uh, starting with the AF placement in order to see which is the best combination of uh, the clients, number of clients, and in terms of the uh, location where to place them. Once having placed these uh, uh, AF functions, um, then uh, the training parcel come to, comes into the place in order to detect if there is any uh, abnormality in the infrastructure. Uh, the framework that was presented by Noor, uh, uh, the distributed approach, uh, detects if uh, in case of any anomaly, and this uh, result of this uh, detection, which is the state of the system, uh, which describes uh, if there is a normal condition and an abnormal condition, this uh, information will be passed on to the uh, decision making block, which involves uh, a reinforcement learning agent. Here, uh, we decided to use uh, reinforcement learning uh, in order to learn this um, very dynamic environment automatically and propose a policy that is uh, opti both optimal and uh, fast faster compared to any other heuristic approach. And once we have the uh, RL agent sufficiently trained, the RL agent will propose some actions that will be passed on to the orchestration. Uh, orchestration uh, here, we have some uh, management entities. These actions will be sent to the management entities and then uh, they will try to implement this in the uh, concerning platform. Here um, I'll try to present the uh, component level uh, uh, description of each um, sub block that is involved in this uh, automation loop. First of all, we have the infrastructure itself. Uh, beginning with the physical servers, uh, which con con contains different types of resources uh, such as storage, compute, and network. And then we use the virtualization layer in order to um, make this um, infrastructure uh, virtual, uh, which is useful in order to deploy the virtual network functions in different containers. So the idea here is that we have these different levels of uh, infrastructure, then collect the metrics from this, and then send it to the um, uh, anomaly detection block. Before that, uh, here I only consider the physical and virtual layer, uh, virtual level um, uh, metrics. Uh, for the moment, I'm not considering the access level uh, metrics. Um, to make it somewhat simpler, uh, first to see, uh, you know, how, what is the performance of RL agent, and then uh, we could scale it to um, additional like uh, access level uh, nodes as well. So once having collected the data from this infrastructure, this data will be sent to uh, anomaly detector. Clearly in this case, uh, um, it could be either central or uh, even the distributed approach that we have. Once uh, upon having the anomaly detector, now uh, the anomaly in the case of anomaly or even in the case of uh, normal behavior, uh, the state of the system will be presented to the uh, reinforcement learning module. In this reinforcement learning module, we have an uh, um, RL agent which will look at this uh, state of the system and propose uh, some actions. At the beginning, we start with a random policy in the sense like uh, we randomly select some actions and then try to reinforce based on the reward that we obtain for selecting uh, each action. 
once uh, having sufficiently our even during the training process once you propose an action this set of actions will be sent to the uh, various blocks of uh, management various management entities that are part of this uh, orchestration block such as um, network function virtualization um, uh, orchestrator vnfm and sdn controller and uh, virtual infrastructure manager and then they are responsible for implementing these action uh, these actions in terms of as a reconfiguration for the platform so first of all i would like to uh, present some fundamental um, details about the reinforcement learning here this is a very classic presentation of reinforcement learning in the sense we have an environment and we have an agent uh, an intelligent agent that tries to learn uh, the behavior of this environment by proposing actions and observing the reaction so an agent will propose the action and environment uh, will try to implement that and upon implementing this the state of the system uh, clearly changes. So when the state of the system changes, you either know if it is a good action or a bad action. Then based on this, each action uh, will be associated with a reward computation. So in term, when the action is good, you will have a, a very good reward. And if it is not the case, then the reward will point you that, that this action is not a good action. So then this reward and state will be sent to the agent. Agent will try to reinforce based on this reward if the action is good um, and, or bad, if it is good, the agent will try to reuse the action again. If it is not the case, then agent might try to avoid this action as much as possible. I will pr present a very simple example to see how uh, this uh, you know this works. Let us say that uh, we have a, um, a automatic driving scenario, uh, which is. Uh, it's a very like you know popular example for this. Let's say that uh, this car for the car the uh, has three actions to choose from: either drive straight, left, or right. And the state of the system is that the car survives or it gets crashed. So if the action is chosen such that it goes straight, then it's a good action. Clearly, a uh, stronger reward will be assigned to this then the automatic system knows that this action is a feasible action and when it, the, such a situation comes again it will try to replicate this action clearly because at the beginning you don't know which actions to choose so you choose randomly and then if in case uh, you choose to i mean the automatic systems so choose to go right then it is not a optimal choice here because it might get crashed or it might run into the other lane uh, crashing other cars so in which case the uh, there will be a strongly uh, opposing reward that will uh, enforce that this is not a clearly good choice and then then it makes another choice to go to the right maybe now the, uh, it stops at in the correct lane so this is a positive reward so by playing this again and again again uh, you know following this environment uh, this sometimes a stochastic environment you try to learn which are the good actions uh, over a long period of time, then having sufficiently learned that the, the, you have a clear policy to choose an action based on a uh, state of the system. So now coming back to our um, platform, the platform here, um, there are different reconfiguration actions that you could choose from. One being the horizontal uh, scaling approach where you can uh, scale the containers vertically and horizontally, or you could choose from rerouting, but for the moment to keep it, uh, keep the uh, actions at compact, uh, we go with uh, scaling actions, but later um, we would like to uh, include other actions such as rerouting and others. So to begin with, the horizontal scaling means that we have number of containers that can be either scaled out or scaled in based on the uh, requirement. So you take these actions. So sometimes it's uh, you want to see if increasing the number of containers can re you know, resolve this uh, problem. And then we have the vertical scaling. Vertical scaling in the sense you have this one container and in this container you would like to increase the number of resources. 
either you could use uh, increase uh, the number of cpu cores or uh, increase the memory or increase the bandwidth there are different resources that you could uh, either increase or decrease so for the representation purpose i choose to go with uh, cpu cores these are the two actions uh, that we have uh, now let's see the very critical uh, design parameter in, in reinforcement learning is the design of the reward the entire learning uh, the quality of learning uh, it clearly depends on how you design the reward because the reinforcement is happening through the uh, you know by observing the reward that uh, agent receives so if the reward design is not optimal there is uh, it is very difficult for the agent to learn an optimal policy that gives you uh, a trade off a stronger trade off in terms of speed and uh, quality of the solution so sorry here uh, we have different details. We have the state space, uh, which proposes the different states. And then we have the actions that I uh, earlier discussed. The state space uh, clearly includes uh, two types of states. One is that there is an anomaly in the platform, or there is no anomaly. So we consider this broad category of uh, the state. And then uh, the actions, different actions, we have uh, either uh, choose to do nothing, or scale horizontally or scale vertically. So we have this broader three uh, categories of uh, action space. And the reward is clearly is. Um, uh, for example, if you see this image here. We could measure the distance between the actual normal uh, spare state space and the, uh, uh, the observed anomaly. So this distance tells you how strong uh, or like less strong the anomaly is. So what we then uh, we uh, decided to do is that you de uh, we design a uh, reward, which is um, um, which is exactly opposite to the distance. So we take uh, we take this and use the reciprocal of uh, this uh, distance, which is the means um, uh, which is the uh, norm of the mean square error. Uh, mean square error uh, gives us the state of the system because if the mean square error uh, that is that we that is computed by the plat uh, the um, AF platform then you will have uh, you will come uh, you will compare it with the threshold and if the uh, mean square error is above the threshold then you know that there is a presence of anomaly and then we use this distance uh, that is computed between the either origin or an acceptable state uh, of the system to the uh, anomaly that has been observed so the objective here is to minimize this distance by proposing different actions and see which are the actions that would take uh, the system from a, an abnormal situ situation to the normal situation. One classic approach, um, I mean, uh, not classic, but in, in general, uh, one popular approach for this is to use the deep reinforcement learning with help of uh, Q networks. Uh, by now, we, I mean, it is clearly established that the neural networks have a very strong, uh, you know, impact in terms of approximating. Uh, the data um, and finding an approximate function to match the data and the output. So given the number of actions that we have and number of the uh, states that we uh, we have uh, been observing, it, it is a it is a wise choice to go with uh, such a network because there is um, uh, mathematically it is very difficult to establish a function that represents these um, states and the uh, uh, actions. So, which is why we went with uh, this Q learning approach, deep Q learning approach. Here, um, this formula is the more fundamental formula in uh, uh, deep Q learning, which allows you to uh, compute a function, a uh, compute a reward based on state and not only state and action as well. So, you are in a state and you take a different action. This will give you a reward in terms of like whether this action will give you. Um, better reward or not because it is also considering what happens in future. So the gamma parameter here that you observe is uh, a pa parameter that allows you to see, decide like how far into future you would look at uh, in terms of taking uh, the impact of current uh, action. So if the gamma is higher, that means you are looking too far into the future uh, in, in uh, with regards to the impact of the uh, current action. If you keep the gamma down, uh, to a, a minimum uh, value, it's between zero and one. Then you don't really um, focus on the um, focus on the impact of this action too much into the future. 
So the overall objective here is to learn a policy that is both optimal and uh, fast. I mean, you know, when implemented is faster uh, using deep neural networks. Uh, it is still an on ongoing work, uh, so we don't have any uh, results as of now. Um, maybe in, uh, in future we will be able to present some results uh, regarding this. But this is, I mean, clearly sometimes it's not possible to uh, always obtain the optimal uh, results even using uh, reinforcement learning. But it, the idea is to here uh, is to put push the solution as close to uh, the optimal solution as possible, uh, which is somewhat difficult from uh, difficult using the heuristics. Um, so that is clearly the idea here. Now um, that concludes my in the presentation of the automated reconfiguration. I would like to hand over the floor to my colleague um, Passion who will present you the details of the data pipelining impact on the detection performance. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to thank you, Naresh, for this detailed presentation that you made on, um, on the reconfiguration, algorithm for reconfiguration. So my name is Passion Tumba, I'm postdoc uh, at uh, NAM we are in the org team with uh, Stefano and Francoise, who she's not here actually. She, so uh, I'm going to present the data pipeline uh, impact on detection of performance. So uh, the idea of introducing the data pipeline is we need to bring the data uh, from the data source uh, to the uh, fidelity learning framework uh, to the fidelity lear learning framework for anomaly detection. So the idea is uh, we need uh, the fidelity learning should learn uh, the behavior, the, the state of the system in real time. That's why we need to bring this data in real time. Then that's why we use uh, the data pipeline system. So thank you. Actually, uh, the data pipeline system, as I introduced, uh, enabled to collect the monitored network data from data source in real time. Then we use a topic based publish subscribe in order to route uh, network data from data sources to specific IF. Uh, then, uh, as the data are produced in real time, we don't need to, to store this data for long periods. So, the system must learn uh, the uh, the framework for anomaly detection must learn uh, the current system of uh, the current set of the system. That's why we introduce uh, we consider to queue network data on the fly until they are they are they are fetched. Once they are fetched, they will be uh, removed from the system. Then, uh, as the data also are in real time, we need to process this data in uh, in real time. So, actually. Uh, in order to improve uh, the artificial intelligence uh, function, uh, the performance of artificial intelligence function, the preprocessing step is very important. So, uh, in offline manner, this can uh, in uh, in offline manner this can be done uh, directly. But however, in online manner, we don't know uh, we we don't know we have uh, the data that are coming in, in real time. So the idea is to use the stream processing uh, pattern in order to process this data in real time. So uh, in general uh, speaking, uh, the design of the data pipeline system that we introduce uh, in, in fact to support the closed loop network automation, which is the chain of uh, 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 function that uh, that's, uh, is um, the ingress network data broker function, the network data preprocessing function, and the egress network data uh, broker functions that I'm going to detail in this in the following uh, slide. The ingress network data broker function uh, buffer the raw uh, network data that are published from the data source, and uh, this broker enable to make uh, the raw network data available for the next component, which is the uh, network data processing functions. Actually, as we consider a topic based uh, subs uh, publish subscribe approach. The network data processing function should subscribe first in order to get uh, this uh, uh, monitored uh, uh, data from uh, the, the broker side. The next component is uh, once the network data processing function uh, uh, 
um, get get the data, we use a windowing in order to set network data uh, as a tariff into finite sets, and from this uh, from this window, we constantly process uh, the network data per, uh, in each cycle. So the processing task form a workflow of tasks that can be we can show for an example here we have a task for that uh, a task for windowing the data uh, into a, 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 a specific number of batches and uh, the normalization for example the normalization of this data and for example the, the reshaping of the data in order to fit uh, the data in the expected format uh, by the uh, at the artificial intelligence function The last step is the egress uh, network data broker function that enable to buffer the, pre the previous preprocessed network data published by uh, the network data preprocessing function and make this uh, preprocessed data available for uh, the IF that uh, may uh, subscribe, uh, that may subscribe in order to get this data in order to, to perform the uh, inference or the learning. Here yeah, I show a, an example of a possible integration of uh, the data pipeline system with uh, artificial intelligence function. As you can see, we take uh, the use uh, the use case for of federated learning uh, for anomaly detection that was pre presented before. Uh, as you can see, uh, the data are collected from uh, a five G based system in which. Uh, the structure here we divide the this the system in subset of data sources that can be, for example, base station or user equipment from which we can collect this data. Then, then we divide uh, uh, then each subset of the data uh, each subset of the data source um, publish the network data to the corresponding uh, in in grace network data broker function and. Each network data preprocessing function preprocess the network data and publish to the corresponding uh, egress network data preprocessing uh, function. Uh, at the level of, of the federated learning, each IF client subscribe to the uh, corresponding uh, egress network data uh, broker function in order to get the preprocessed data, then perform the training on the network uh, data from a sub, uh, from the subset of the system. Um, then at the level of the IEF server, the IEF server will aggregate the learning process of each IEF client. In this case, at the level of uh, the IEF server, we can, the IEF server will provide a, mod, a, a model that corresponds to the overall system. Okay. So once we introduce uh, the data pipeline system, uh, the question is uh, uh, how to where to deploy uh, the, the system on which architecture. Here we show a, a general a rich view of a operator network uh, that uh, contain a set of base station or user equipment, uh, a set of core network uh, per group of base station and the user equipment, and the border server between the core network and the internet. The idea of the broader server is some um, uh, some uh, highly distributed application can use some uh, the broader in order to uh, to distribute uh, the the application in order to for load balancing or to serve uh, faster the the content to user equipment. So once uh, we uh, identify uh, the the operator network on which to deploy the the data pipeline system. Yeah, we propose to deploy the IEF at the border of the server, and the possible deployment uh, uh, deployment of the uh, data pipe, data pipeline system function can be uh, on the border server at the core network or uh, at the base station level. Then here we assume that uh, we map the data source to the base station or user equipment. So the question uh, we need also to to look at uh, to identify the performance to analyze the performance of the data pipeline system. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, the data pipeline system it comes with some overheads in terms of time. As the data are produced and sent to the data pipeline system, the first overhead is the time that uh, required to queue the data in the in the data broker, the, the raw uh, uh, network data at the ingress network uh, data broker function, and also the time that uh, each uh, preprocessing function required to preprocess uh, the actual data and the the time uh, the queuing time of the preprocessing data at the egress network broker function. This is at the level of the data pipe at the application level. At the network level, also we consider also uh, some delay that we we consider the front holding delay, which is the delay from the base station to the core network. We consider also the back holding delay, which is the delay uh, from the co uh, the core network to the border server. And also we have uh, we consider the internet edge delay, which is the uh, the delay from the base station to the border server, which actually the sum of uh, the front holding delay and back holding delay. So considering the, this uh, to uh, the coverage of the data pipeline system and the, the actual delay that can be that uh, is more uh, is on. Uh, uh, the actual delay of transferring transferring data from a, a node to another to another node of uh, the operator network. Uh, we consider the performance indicator of the data pipeline system as the data arrival time at the IF at the IF. This is the sum of uh, the queuing times of both the increase and egress data broker function and the uh, the processing time of uh, the data processing function. And the sum also of the um, of the front holding delay and uh, the back holding delay. So it, our assumption is that low data arrival time at I, uh, at the IF location in order to guarantee the real time uh, requirement uh, of the system as uh, for doing the learning or inference for anomaly detection, we need to get the data as quick as possible in real time. Then the object, the the objective, the, per, the good performance of uh, the data pipeline should be to provide data with a low, uh, very low data arrival time. And also, in case uh, for the case of federated learning, synchronization of data data arrival time is uh, very important. If the data arrival time are synchron, uh, the arrival time of the data to the IEF are synchronized. In this case, this prevents to have struggling IEF client from the distributed learning aggregation. So uh, prior to before to uh, to evaluate uh, the um, the performance of the data pipeline system in operator network, we need uh, to emulate uh, a realistic operator network. In this respect, we use traffic trace extracted from a French operator that uh, in the frame uh, the, the data that is provided in the framework of uh, the Coco 5G INR project. So we use actually three billion of TCP session extracted a weekday and a weekend day in June of 2023. Uh, the trends that we we are uh, we are interested interesting are we consider the delay from the base station to a core network that was presented initially as the front holding delay. We consider also the delay from a base station to a mobile application server deployed uh, on uh, a border car about the key uh, that was introduced previously as the internet had delay. Then also we consider also the service provider and also uh, these these trace of data are aggregated on uh, 1036 attack uh, level. The aggregation uh, enabled to ensure privacy of uh, um, of uh, TCP session of uh, uh, use equipment TCP session. So, in order to uh, to okay, in order to determine uh, the the operator network, uh, the operator network, we need to infer the number of uh, the core network. So, using these data sets, what we did is we select the the TCP session that belong to service pro provider that we uh, that are known highly distributed. That can be, for example, Google, uh, could be uh, WhatsApp, uh, Deezer, and even Akamai. So. 
Then from uh, this TCP session, we calculate the back in delay and the uh, 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 probability density function. The back in delay is actually the difference between the internet edge delay and the uh, front in de uh, delay. Uh, the assumption is that uh, from some uh, from a same core network, the back holding delay will follow a normal distribution, and from different core network delay, we have multiple dis distribution with a different mean values. Then the number of the distribution will correspond to the number of the core network. As you can see in uh, in the plots, here we plot we we selected uh, TCP session for uh, YouTube, uh, for Google, Deezer, and WhatsApp. And then after uh, uh, building, uh, after, cal after calculating the, uh, the probability density function, we adopt a network, delay, uh, a a network topology with a free core network and for border. This is because we consider uh, uh, from the probability density uh, pro from the probability density function, we select the distribution that has the highest uh, the highest uh, uh, density, uh, density value, the, the highest mean uh, value of the delay, which is around uh, 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, and 40 milliseconds. So we use uh, uh, this distribution, then we, we, uh, we build uh, our operator network that we have three core network and four border. Well, the different, uh, the, the remaining parameter of the operator network that we consider actually in order to emulate these test beds, we consider an operator network topology with three VM uh, for each border, three VM for each core network, and one physical server on which we deploy a set of uh, data source. This data source was implemented like uh, container docker, then we deploy up to uh, 750 uh, container docker. Uh, these data sources are evenly distributed among the free VM of uh, the core network. Then we use a Python script for collecting and publishing the sample of CPU related metric to the uh, data uh, processing uh, that uh, to the data pipeline system. For the, the delay of the, uh, the operator network, uh, so for the backhauling delay, we consider the mean value that we obtain uh, from the uh, the probability density function. Um, then for the front holding delay uh, from the data we, we calculate, uh, from the data uh, that we have, uh, we observe that uh, for the front holding, uh, for the front holding delay, uh, the, the delay that we can uh, set, it is an interval between one millisecond and 20 milliseconds. This is the delay from the container to the uh, free uh, core network. For the setting of uh, the data preprocessing uh, data uh, pipeline system function, we consider, as we consider free, uh, as we consider, uh, we assume that we deploy the IEF uh, at the border uh, at the border level. Then we consider free client, free IEF client, and one IEF server. Uh, this way we use the fidelity learning framework for anomaly detection and this training is um, for, uh, is performed uh, we perform uh, on 100 rounds of batch size of uh, 200 sample of uh, CPU related metric then for each IF in general we consider free chain of the data data pipeline system function where each uh, client AF get real time training data from the chain of the ingress network data broker function, uh, the network data preprocessing function, and the egress network data broker function. We use Kafka broker to implement uh, uh, both the ingress and egress network data broker function, and we use Python-based scripts to implement the network data preprocessing uh, function. So we consider free baseline deployment setup of uh, the data uh, pipeline pipeline system function in the emulated operator network. Consider uh, both the deployment, core deployment, and the edge deployment. So for the edge deployment, um, here we assume that, uh, as uh, we assume that the, uh, the AI 
the AIF nodes are fixed on the border, then uh, we deploy uh, the egress and the egress network data broker function and the network uh, data preprocessing function on the border server. Then we deploy the uh, ingress network data broker function on the core network and uh, the data source are mapped to the base station uh, or the user equipment at the low level of uh, uh, at the bottom level of the operator network hierarchy. For the core network here we for the core network deployment here we consider still uh, the IF nodes are fixed on the at the border level then uh, all uh, the function of the data pipelines, uh, data pipeline system are deployed at the level of the core network, and uh, the data source are still uh, mapped to the base station or use equipment. Finally, for the edge deployment of the data pipeline system function, we uh, we we said uh, the IF remain uh, deployed on the uh, the IF nodes are fixed on the border server. Then we we deploy the egress network uh, uh, data broker function at the level of the core network. Then we deploy uh, we deploy the network data preprocessing function and the ingress network data broker function at the level of uh, closer to the data source. Uh, so we can say at the edge of the user equipment uh, uh, at. The, at the edge of the user equipment. Uh, this is where uh, the data source, so we map also the data source to the user equipment. Um, okay. So here we, sh after uh, showing the different uh, deployment shame that we consider here, we show uh, some uh, result analysis that we have. First of all, we present the preprocessing and queuing time of, of uh, the, the data that, are pro that was simulated. Here we, uh, in the figure, the first plot of preprocessing time, we observe that uh, we have high data preprocessing time uh, that reach up to 12 seconds uh, for the border or core network deployment, and we have up to 10 seconds for the edge deployments. Um, another point uh, is that uh, this preprocessing time includes also the uh, the queuing time, uh, the queuing time, this, the queuing time, this. Uh, correspond to the, the time that the data remain on the ingress network data broker function. And also, as we consider windowing, we windowing uh, the data, we, we set um, uh, a count based window that we define that the pre each preprocessing uh, uh, step will start until we uh, in the window we have up to uh, two, uh, 200 samples. As you can see, uh, this waiting time has, uh, highly, um, has an, an high impact on the preprocessing time. Um, that's uh, that's why uh, we have in overall the preprocessing time is uh, very high. Look at uh, looking at at the queuing time here. We can see that uh, the queuing time at the egress network data uh, data broker function side, there is no data windowing, and uh, we have lower queuing time. The ways of uh, to improve uh, the preprocessing pre time is to use some uh, well-known optimized framework, for example, Apache Flink, uh, in order to implement the network data uh, preprocessing function that uh, has uh, uh, best optimized. That was uh, optimized uh, in order to uh, to take uh, to, pr to process uh, data in real time for uh, to process data in real time. Uh, the second metric that we consider is the actual uh, performance indicator of uh, the data pipeline system, which is the data arrival time. As you can see here, uh, at the edge deployment, the edge deployment uh, we can say that it improved the data arrival time at IEF uh, clients. We have uh, actually the, a negligible delay from data source to uh, ingress network data broker and from the ingress network data broker to the uh, uh, network data broker, uh, network data processing function. This, uh, the, all these three components are deployed on uh, these two components are deployed in the same node. Then we don't have uh, the, uh, such a delay related to the network. 
as uh, the network data preprocessing function are deployed uh, closer to the data source, so this, uh, the data that are sent actually to the uh, egress network data broker function is uh, reduced, then we, we have a reduced delay of transferring data from uh, the preprocessing node to the egress network data broker. In terms of uh, synchronization, we, we can see that uh, we have a good balance in the data arrival time at, to the IF, which uh, will contribute to synchronize the learning process between the IF client and the IF server. So for the second deployment is the border deployment where we have a higher uh, data arrival time at the IF client. Actually, in this, uh, in this setup, we have high loads at the core network. Uh, okay, we have high loads uh, actually at the border uh, at the border. Okay, at the border uh, at the border level, as uh, the border hosts both uh, the network uh, data preprocessing function in network uh, in network. Okay, in great network data broker function uh, for each IEF client. And also we have a high load of uh, on the network link or as all the data, uh, the raw data are sent from uh, the data source uh, to the border uh, to the border side where uh, actually the preprocessing uh, is happened in this case of deployment. Uh, we have there is some uh, imbalance in the data arrival time at the IEF, but uh, this imbalance can be considered like uh, negligible. At the core deployment, uh, the core deployment in terms of uh, arrival, uh, data arrival rate, data arrival time, we have a trade off. Uh, this make a trade off uh, between uh, the edge deployment and the border deployment. However, uh, we observe that we have a high imbalance in the data arrival time at the IEF. Uh, this uh, deployment is more likely to lead to out, out of sync of the global learning process with the IEF server. So the possible ways of uh, improvement could be to explore the optimization solution uh, in order to calculate, for example, the number of uh, data uh, data process uh, data pipeline system function to deploy with respect, for example, the number of data sources that uh, exist, and also to calculate an efficient placement of the data pipeline uh, system function, and also an efficient assignment of data source to the uh, ingress network data broker functions. Um, so, okay, uh, so this was actually, uh, we, so to, to sum up, we introduced a data pipeline system. This data pipeline system uh, enabled to, uh, to produce data in real time uh, and feed this data to the uh, uh, IEF, uh, to the uh, artificial intelligence function. So the result that we get is was a small test bed. So I'm going to, to give hands to, to my colleague, uh, to my colleague Sala and uh, Dung in order to present a realistic deployment of uh, both the data pipeline system and uh, uh, the uh, fidelity learning framework, for, uh, performing the uh, learning and also the inference in real time. So I stop sharing you. So go can show. Okay, and now uh, uh, for, for the demo, uh, our colleague uh, Sala is sharing the screen. Thank you. 
Can you hear me now? Switch off here. Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to show you uh, a technical demonstration um, about federated learning on uh, real time data uh, that Pasio uh, has. Uh, I showed in the uh, his presentation. Uh, sorry. Sure. Here. Yeah. Uh, just uh, I'll uh, talk about the whole uh, physical infrastructure. Uh, to run this uh, demo. Uh, we have three physical servers for data collection and deployment of our framework, which is called uh, Vlad uh, EX. Uh, each server has two CPUs with eight, core, uh, with eight cores per CPU uh, and 348 uh, GB of memory. Uh, we, uh, for data sources, uh, we are um, Training our uh, model zone, our G node B is, uh, which is part of uh, SRS uh, run. We use the Kubernetes uh, to run uh, our uh, AIFs, and this AIFs uh, is up code. We have uh, nine client AIFs and one server corresponds to the underlying uh, data sources. Uh, we have one physical server for data pipeline, pipeline system functions uh, with two CPUs with eight cores and uh, uh, 96 uh, GB of memory. And we have three different functions on, on that server. Uh, have you seen before this uh, figure? Uh, this is the uh, configuration of um, our uh, framework uh, where we have uh, AIFs where the training is done and uh, a local model is trained and then it's sent to the server. The server does the aggregation and also does the anomaly uh, detection. So we'll go through the um, demo now. Now we're going to run our uh, Kubernetes. The number of clients are nine, which uh, corresponds to the uh, number of uh, genoid bits. Uh, I see the system is, uh, is running. Uh, Kubernetes is constructing uh, the containers. Just we'll wait a little bit till all the containers are uh, deployed. Now we have, as you see from the screen, we have um, eight, uh, nine um, clients and one server running on the run on different servers.
this uh, we have a log of the server where we can um, see a summary of uh, the model. And this one of the clients, which has already uh, now they are running. Uh, what we can see here, uh, first of all, we these are different um, uh, rounds, and at each round uh, we take the uh, data from uh, real time data from the pipeline, and then we fit it, it into the training function. And uh, then we send it to the server, and the server uh, do the aggregation and comes back with the global model where we uh, deduce the uh, uh, MS, uh, the mean square error. Uh, you can see here the average uh, mean square error for genode B. This, this is basically for server, uh, for uh, client uh, zero. Here we see some parameters. It's basically the training when it started and when it ended, and the training time as well. Just coming back to the server, here we see the registration of different uh, lines with the server, where the server since the global model, uh, model to them. Uh, for the anomaly detection, uh, we'll run now the detection model. Yeah, what we can see on the uh, left uh, windows, uh, we see the uh, MEC value, and we have the red line, which is the uh, threshold. Now, the, this is like uh, normal data, so we cannot see any uh, like anomaly. Uh, this data comes from the stress bucket uh, loss uh, test. Uh, on the right window, we see the anomaly signature. Uh, what we can see in this window, uh, we see the signature, which is basically the uh, uh, different values for the MECs in one sample. Here we see uh, very uh, few like lines or uh, uh, points, which is, that means there is no real uh, like anomaly. And they are corresponding to each other. When we see any anomaly here, we will we'll see the signature on the other windows. So we need to wait to see if there are any anomalies. As long as the below, the, the block does not exceed or does not cross the threshold, that means there is no anomaly. So now we saw some anomaly. Uh, and uh, this anomaly corresponds to the data or we are getting from the underlying uh, uh, so resource. Uh, here, this resource is only for one uh, G node, uh, G node B. As you see that, that we have anomalies, we, we see it on the right screen that the signature, the, 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 the windows becomes like crowded with the, the blot.
the training is still on. Can see different uh, like AIF. So, okay. Here we can. Thank you very much. Is he open your mind? Thank you. So, any questions? Okay, there's one question. Yes, Kayan. Hey, hey, um, please go ahead. So, um, I have a question. How did you de determine these thresholds? Because most of the times it's a part of validation sets and there is none here. So how did you actually determine this uh, red value? Uh, the threshold determ determination is actually, <laughs> what happens here that is that, uh, sorry, just a minute. Okay, uh, what happens is that, um, when you're doing the training part on the normal behavior, uh, you have these MSCs uh, that are computed. And once you have all these uh, MSC values that you collect, um, but that are produced part of the training, um, you take this distribution. Either uh, you could choose the maximum value of uh, out of this distribution as a threshold, or you could uh, you know, choose uh, average of this uh, distribution that you have uh, in terms of uh, the uh, mean square error produced at each round. Uh, of the uh, training part and then you can use this um, uh, value as a threshold so when you inject uh, an anomaly clearly that uh, the behavior of this um, uh, data changes and the auto encoder is uh, trained to replicate the normal behavior so whenever there is a spark deviation between the normal data and the, the observed data uh, it will produce a higher msc and this higher uh, higher MSE could be uh, higher than the chosen um, uh, MSE value out, out of the collected distribution earlier during the training part. Uh, is that clear, or uh, would you like some more clarification? Mm, no, it's good. Okay, so you most of the time take the maximum value during the training sets. Yes. Okay. I mean, it could be maximum or uh, any other statistical parameter like uh, average, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the moment, yeah, yeah, it's collected ninety nine percentile of the data. Sorry. I have a question. When you uh, demo was uh, run, there was an anomaly. But uh, is there? Did you have any way to identify what type of anomaly it was and what was the root cause of the anomaly um, to get take action? Yes, I mean, for the distributed learning, we don't have the root cause analysis yet, I believe. But for the, uh, there was a previous work, um, part of this, uh, with another other colleague who implemented a Siroka framework, which was a centralized framework. Uh, he proposed uh, a root cause uh, system where, like, you know, you could also get into the, not only detect the anomaly, but go into the details as to you know, what is the type of anomaly and where it is occurring um, by producing some side, sort of a radiography between uh, different layers and uh, the MSE values, not only to see uh, like, you know, how it is propagating from physical layer to the uh, upper layers, like uh, uh, virtual layer and even the um, access point layers. So it's not connected to this framework, the distributed framework, but we do have a root cause analysis uh, framework earlier. Yeah, for the centralized. Right? Yeah, for the centralized. Then you, you focus in, on AAF for on federated learning, which is distributed. Yes. So is it uh, for future work to, to derive some uh, root cause analysis? Because 
if I look at the overall picture that was shown by you, mm -hmm. you have to execute the plan. So that means that you have to decide what type of action you have to uh, to implement. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do understand. Um, even if the root cause analysis is uh, still centralized, I think uh, we, it's it's not a problem. We, we could still identify where the problem is. The uh, main objective of uh, using distributed learning is in terms of reducing the delay. So we could use this uh, distributed uh, learning to reduce the delay. And of course, we could also uh, propose a distributed uh, root cause analysis method, but for the moment, we could still use the centralized model in order to identify where is the problem. Now there is no, if I can complain, there is no functional requirement to do root cause analysis. The detection can also be done in a distributed way. Yes. So in the case in which the detection is done in this way, then it will make sense for a latency reason. Also, because of analysis, there is a good That would imply that the reinforcement learning approach that is actually done with its implementing, that that would also be distributed. What the one that next question can possibly ensure would be it would be a would be a difference in running. The uh, reconfiguration of part to a certain way because the case in which it will be run in a centralized way. Yes, yes, in terms of like uh, the definitely uh, latency, there will be obviously its. Uh, uh, approach itself you know, gives you some advantage in terms of latency if you have a, a distributed approach especially using a different maybe i mean there are different ways you can implement or reinforcement learning in a distributed manner one is using multiple agents or uh, um, i don't recall the other method but uh, one possibility is to have multiple agents to be trained parallelly and um, these multiple agents will be able to localize, not maybe exactly to the point, but some kind of localization will be achieved. Because if there is an agent that uh, you know that uh, proposes an action, and then that uh, observes a feedback where that there is a, a kind of an anomaly, then you have a particular idea. Maybe it is coming from this node, uh, not from a, you know an another node. So that's one possibility. Uh, that that's stretching the work towards like you know a future. But, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I, I'm continuing. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Even if you are not addressing exactly the root cause analysis, mm -hmm. you have to take action for anomaly detection because the system cannot continue as it is. Yes, I one one difficulty with respect to the centralized reinforcement learning is that when you want to scale it, like you know, uh, yes. to the entire network, it's so difficult because you have so much uh, state space that you have to cover, and possibly different types of action. If, if you consider routing, the finding the shortest path itself can take uh, quite quite a while because it's a very hard problem. So, it, with that respect, is the uh, there is a strong advantage if you can distribute uh, the learning itself in terms of agents. Uh, that of course will uh, alleviate some problem, and also the routing can be little um, with uh, some kind of coordination between uh, different agents. You will have a faster uh, routing approach as well. Good. Any other questions? Now, then, let's thank all the speakers for their time. And the webinar is closed.